Tonight we're going to be talking about from fan to field. And uh, we, we've been in this series talking about how we go from milk to meat. And basically what that means is that the Bible tells us that we start off as babies when we come to know Jesus Christ, but then we grow up doing the greater things for God. And when it comes to the Bible and what the Bible is instructing us, everyone is going to be at different levels. Everyone is going to be at a different place or what we call maturity or, or learning curve or understanding. So it's no one greater than the other. It's all of us put together to make one team or as the Bible calls us, one church. That's what the unity of the Bible church is about. It's not about everyone in one location or doing exactly the same thing. It's about everyone being in a, in a participated mode of being a part of the kingdom of God. That we're not spectators anymore once we say yes to Jesus Christ, but now we are participants in the kingdom of God. So we're going to be talking about from fan to player, from fan to the field, from being in the grandstands to being on the playing field. Now, I grew up loving football, playing football, uh, playing on the road. You know how you would play two-hand touch and then it turned into tackle on gravel? Yeah, it, it becomes that because it, it's competitive. And then as you grow up, you play football and you got to get the right gear. You play like termite, peewee, pop warner, high school, and then you go on to college and then uh, NFL. I didn't have a team growing up. So a couple of years ago, actually two years ago, People in this church pressured me to finally find a team. So I actually went to Jesus and I said, what is the best team for me? And he said, the Detroit Lions. Now, they did well the other year, but not this year. And there are some things that happened that they did finish okay. But if you're a sports fan, you understand what it means and the difference between being a fan and being a player. And it doesn't have to be football. It could be soccer. It could be bowling. It could be baseball. It could be any type of sports that if you love that sport, you know there is a major difference between sitting on the sidelines and watching and going on the playing field. And tonight, I want to encourage us as the church that we would develop that kind of heart to go from fan, just being in the, in the seats, just watching the game go on, and then getting on the field. And there's going to be a big challenge tonight. So if you're ready to take notes, turn to, the, to Hebrews 13, I believe it is. Or Hebrews chapter 4, excuse me. And we're going to be in uh, verse, Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 5. So I have this football. Now, some of you played football before. And whenever you see a football, it just does something to you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was in... High school, and I played football, I wasn't as passionate about it until after I graduated from high school. And then I would watch other pe people play football. Or I would see my son playing when he began to play, and I would feel like, oh, I, I should be playing. I can do that. Or I watch high school football, and I think I should put on some pads. I wish they could put me in. Or you watch on TV, and you think, well, I, I know I can't go on the NFL, but... If I had a chance, I would love to at least be a part of what is happening on the team. I would love to be in the huddle, listen to what's going on, and see what's happening. Now, some of you, you're a football fan, and that word fan is just short for fanatic. You're a football fanatic. You go into your house, and right when you open the doors, dun, 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 dun. You just, you just have that sense every week. That Sunday when, when football comes up, you miss church just because the game is on. Or you, you watch the game all up until third service and you're saying, yeah, I can still go church. Or you come super early at 7 o'clock in the morning because you know your game is going to be on at 11. And you normally would never come to church at 7 o'clock in the morning. But because the game is on, you make that adjustment. Isn't it amazing how much sports can change us? Now, I'm holding this football. Some of you are already seen. I like to throw. So, Lino, I'm just going to throw you a couple of passes, okay? You got to stand up because I don't want to hit Ren in the back of you. Okay, so tell me this doesn't do something to you if you're a football fan. That just watching the, where's Kenny? I know Kenny is here too. Where's Kenny? Where's Kenny? Kenny, you got to go far. You're tall, that's why, Kenny. Okay, if I hit the camera, it's your fault, Kenny. Well, I, trust, I trusted you on that one, Kenny. Whoa, where's Eli? Okay, Eli's back here. Eli, 
Oh, you're going to stand right there. That's <laughs> Oh. <laughs> hey, you got to stretch, Eli. Because <laughs> you could have caught that. I know you could have. Okay, let's, let's try this. Okay, good. Whew. Nervous for some reason. Okay, perfect. You've been throwing good. Okay, that's enough. We good. We good. We two, we, we two for one or one for two. So, what, are you nervous? How many of you were scared the football was going to hit you? Okay, th- some people are leaving church right now. So, that they, were, they were scared. It, something happens when you see a game being played. Now, in the kingdom of God, what happens is when we say yes to Jesus, our spirit awakens. I think every single one of us experience that. Our spirit awakens. It's called regeneration. Our spirit was dead, but because of Christ, it is now alive. But there's a reason why it's alive. It's like the draft that's going to come up next year. I think Detroit Lions should get the first pick because they weren't doing so good this year. However, when there's a draft pick, that means whoever they are picking is going to be on a team. They don't draft a player, whether it's NFL, NBA, any type of professional sports, they don't draft that player to tell them you're going to sit in the grandstands. And they don't do that. Why? Because that's not why they're drafted. That's not the purpose for them being drafted. Now, in the kingdom of God, there's a reason why we're saved. There's a reason why we're so-called drafted into the kingdom of God. And the reason is so that we can be on the playing field, just like any professional sports. There's a purpose for you being drafted. Now, what we do sometimes is we're like the number one draft pick or the, the star player. We have all of this talent, energy, and skill, and even the heart to serve God. But then when God says, I came to save you, here's salvation, you are now with me in eternity. For some of us, we take that as that's the end of what I was striving for. That's the reason why God brought me to this point is so that I could be saved. The only problem with that is if God's only reason were for us to be saved, then the moment you said yes to him, what would have happened? Yeah, you would have gone to heaven with him. If that was God's only purpose for us to be saved, the moment we said yes to him, poof, we're gone. We'd be, we would have no more purpose here on this earth. So God says, well, you can come home to be with me in heaven now if that was the only reason. But for some reason, we'll, we're still here. Now in Hebrews chapter 5, it says this, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. Who because of practice have have, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So there's a practice that comes in on this. And it's not just because we're believers that God says, here's where spiritual maturity comes in. It's when you practice these things. It's not because we're a believer. It's because we need practice. I need practice. You need practice. And thanks be to God as the coach that he says, you're on my field. So because you're on my field, every time you practice, I will be there coaching you. I'm going to help you along the way. But if we were to step off the field and go into the grandstands and be in the bleachers and just cheer on everyone who is there, then how can God teach us when we're not a part of what he's doing? If he's coaching his players on the field and we're up in the grandstands, then we're missing out on getting better and better and better in the position that God has designed us to play. Now the challenge for us tonight is that every single person here is going to be challenged with an area that God wants us to serve him with. Every single person. There's not a person here who will walk out tonight saying that was for someone else. This is for us specifically. In fact, look at the person next to you and say this is for you tonight. 
this is exactly for you. That's the only time we can say this, okay? This is the only time we can say this. If, you're, if no one's around you, just, just say, this is for me. This is for me. Some of us, we've been following Christ for a long time. And, and sometimes it may feel like, well, I've been, I've been with Christ for, you know, 20 years. I've been walking with him 30 years, 15 years, 10 years, 5 years. And sometimes it feels like, boy, I, yeah, I'm still learning. But at the same time, I, I feel like I, I kind of got it together. You know, Heidi and I were talking on the way up to church and, uh, about our devotions. And we're reading about uh, in the book of Exodus how, you know, Moses is now coming to a place of life where he's beginning to understand that there is something far greater for his life in his purpose for living than just being around sheep. Uh, that there's a greater purpose. And we know his purpose, that his purpose was to go to Pharaoh and let Pharaoh know that God says, you got to let my people go so that they can become a nation as well as to worship me. So Moses was there understanding this purpose. And so Heidi and I was just talking about how when the plagues came, Pharaoh's heart was, okay, well, go then. Take the people with you. But when everything was cleaned up, then Pharaoh's heart was hardened once again. It's almost like, Pharaoh felt like, well, when things are bad, I'm going to make a change. But when things are good, why do I need to change? I don't need to. And sometimes we can have that kind of heart if we're not careful. Every Christian can develop a Pharaoh heart. Every one of us are not immune to having a Pharaoh-hardened heart. We just won't know it until God has to come in and maybe bring in some plagues and let us know, I got to soften your heart because it's the best thing for you. And although tonight is going to be challenging, it will be the best challenge for you and I. Because I see God doing great things even still in this next season of our church. This year is the year of harvest. And what that means is God wants more people to come to know him as Lord and Savior. People in your family, in your workplace, people that you pass by, people who come to church. He wants people saved, but not just to get to heaven. It's for a greater cause. In the book of Galatians 5.13, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's Galatians 5.13. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. When Heidi and I first got saved and someone asked us to get involved in ministry, I just thought that was the automatic progression of a believer. I didn't, I didn't think there were, there were options. I didn't think that there was a no involved in this. I didn't think that I could actually say, well, I don't want to. I just thought this is God asking me to use my gifts for him in whatever capacity it was whether it's uh, befriending someone, whether it was smiling or greeting, whether it was parking cars or being with the youth, whatever it was, I just felt like that's the only option. This is the natural progression of a believer. It's to serve Christ to this capacity. So when I was asked and they said, oh, pray about it, I wasn't praying if I would serve or I wouldn't serve. I was praying about where I should serve. Because to me, it was just a natural progression. I think in our church today, not specifically us, but in, the, in the, um, the, the culture of church, we think it's an option to serve or not. I think we've come to a day and age where we think God has taken on options like the world has. And it's almost like God is saying, no, 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 you have it backwards. In the kingdom of God, there's a, there's a certain way I've designed the kingdom to work. And he designed the kingdom to work as the body of Christ. That it's not going to be one person reaching thousands of people. It may very well be thousands of people reaching one person. It may very well be that it's not, Pastor, can you come and, you know, come to my business and talk to these people about Christ? But it's you talking to the people around you about Christ. It may be that God would use you, a friend, 
maybe an, another person from church or another person from another church, and you use five, six, seven people to help that one person come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Because that's how God designed his kingdom. It's all of us put together, not one person. We need each other. We need the body of Christ because we're a team and we're all on his field. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, milk, if we look at milk and meat, milk is about me. That's what milk is. Meat is about serving others. That's the meat. That's the hard stuff. That, you got to chew on that. You can't just swallow steak whole. Some of you try, but milk, easy to go down. Very simple. Doesn't take much to drink milk. Very easy. And some of us like the milk because it's easy. Meat takes a lot of work. Takes some chewing on. Takes some thought. But it's the greatest reward. I think you'd choose steak over a glass of milk any day unless you have cookies. But God designed us that way. See, every person can grow in Christ to a greater capacity when it comes to serving him by understanding what it means to go from just being a fan in the seats or someone who attends church to being a player on the field or someone who puts all they got into serving Christ. And here, we're going to look at three easy ways to understand this. Here's the first thing. When I serve Christ, I grow. It's that simple. When you serve Christ, you grow spiritually. Because there are many challenges that come with serving Jesus that you will never, ever experience aside from serving him. Well, I don't want challenges. No, you want challenges. No, I don't, I don't want problems in my life. It's not necessarily problems. Problems indicate that something's wrong. Challenges indicate God wants to bring something out of you. We do that with our children. In fact, this, this football is actually not mine. I bought this for my grandson, Jaden. And so... We're outside playing football, and he's six years old. And, you know, as pop, I'm like, dude, go for a bomb. We ain't throwing this little, you know, pass, pass. And he runs, and I, I fly, I throw it, and he catches it. And the ball is like half his, his size. And so when he's catching it, I can already see the potential that this kid has. And one time he caught it, and he landed on his stomach, and he dropped the ball. So I said, next time, Jaden, when you catch it, just roll to your back so you don't land on the ball. And he did. And I was like, it's my grandson. It's my grandson. But it's like your coach challenges you not to prove you wrong or to say you can't do this, but the coach challenges you because they see greatness in you. God challenges us. As the Bible says, disciplines us. He disciplines those he loves. Why? Because he sees greatness in you. So when we serve Christ... There are going to be challenges. Serving releases self, and self never allows you to grow and mature. Proverbs 11.25 says that the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. See, when you serve others, something happens to you. And it's not for the sake of, well, what can I get out of this? It's just simply saying, Lord, the way you operate in your kingdom is when I serve you, I grow in you. When I serve you and I give to others and I refresh others, I myself is going to be refreshed. It's just the way God works. He knows how we should serve best. And when you're serving, you're also going to have some challenges to grow. That we can no longer stay the same. That God loves us that much. We always say, come to God. He loves you just as you are. And at the same time with a comma... He loves us too much to keep us that way. He wants to see the greater potential come out inside of us. Some time ago when I was in the youth ministry, I remember I got into this argument with this other guy. He was, he was one of the leaders too. And, and we were arguing, catch this, about what a disciple is. That's what we were arguing about, back and forth. He even printed about, he printed about 15 pages of what a disciple is. And I looked at it and I said, I'm not going to read that whole thing. He said, no, this is what a disciple is. I said, okay. And then, okay, if that's what a disciple is, then good. He goes, no, you need to understand this because what you're saying is not right. And I said, okay, well, I'm still learning, so how about, how about you do this? Can you just highlight for me, like, the main points? He goes, this is the main points. I broke it down. 
like, what was it, like a 50-page thing? He said, well, I just broke it down to make it simple for you. So I said, okay. And then a couple days later, he came back to me. And, and even with myself, I felt, we got to make this right. We're serving in the ministry. And here we are grumbling about what a disciple is. It's like God was saying, I can tell you what a disciple is not. It's not what you guys are doing. You're just showing what a disciple isn't. You're just trying to prove who's right and who's wrong, not who actually is a disciple or what a disciple is. So we came back together and we apologized, made things right. And, and I thought, in ministry, I must change. Which is one of the biggest fears of why people don't serve in ministry. Because I must change. But here's, here's, here's a not so much of a secret. When Christ saved you, and he saved me. I already changed. The problem is not I must change. We, are, we already know that. We want to do that. The problem is the fear of change. Because we don't know what it's going to look like. And we don't want the challenges that come our way. We don't want people to say, you're a hypocrite. Yo, you go to church, you do this. Oh, I see you serving. We don't want that. But this is, I've, I've already made a decision long ago. I don't care if I'm serving Jesus and I'm doing my best to grow, I have people to help me to me and mentoring me and helping me to grow. And people are saying, wow, you go to church and you act like that? Yeah, I'm going to receive to learn. But that's not going to stop me from learning, from growing in Christ. It's not going to stop me from serving Christ. That no matter what anyone says, what matters most is what Christ already said. And he says, you're going to, li you're going to live your life following me. That it came not to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. It's the principle of God's kingdom. I, I liken it to the best CEO around. That in, in God's major company of ministry, of the church, that when you give, he gives back to you even better than what you gave. Let's just say you love, uh, I'll just uh, use the, use the uh, kitchen as an example. You love cooking, so you cook for people. And you just love doing that. There's a reward in that. God rewards you that way. There, there, there are things that you can't really put your finger on that says, I feel so satisfied using my gift for God. But if time goes by and it becomes more about me and not other people and I've forgotten about that, that's the blessing in itself. It's as far as it goes. But if I continue to say, Lord, I'm going to continuously give to you, then he says, well, here's my principle in this. Then whatever you give, it's going to be given back to you even more than what you could imagine. But once it becomes about self, now I'm back to milk again. Meat is always about other people. And yes, whatever heart I serve with is the heart I'll develop. But if I don't serve at all, very difficult to develop a heart for people. Very difficult. The Bible tells us in Galatians 6.10, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Especially to those in the family of faith. Paul the Apostle is writing this to the Galatian church, and he's, he's setting a foundation for how the church is going to operate. And so Paul says, here's how it's going to work. Whenever you see this happening in the kingdom of God, that, that people are going to be serving one another, that's a good thing. Whenever you see people serving each other in the family of faith, that's a good thing. You keep doing that. You keep blessing that. You keep moving in that direction that you're going to do good to everyone, but especially for those in the family of faith. In other words, we have churches all over the place. You may call this your home church. Maybe you're visiting from another church, but that's where your family of faith is. And God says, oh, that's that's where you should especially do good. It's in the family of faith. That's where we grow. That God gives us opportunity after opportunity. 
Whenever we have the opportunity, the Bible tells us, we should be doing good. But especially for those in the family of faith. God gives us opportunities, not excuses. However, the devil gives us excuses, not opportunities. Oh, he'll hand it out. He'll give you excuse after excuse after excuse. And it sounds really, really, really good. Sounds super good. And it's, it's almost valid. It makes sense. But it's still not an opportunity. God says, I give you opportunity after opportunity because we all want to do great things. We want to be great for the kingdom of God. But Jesus said it like this in Matthew 23, verse 11, the greatest among you must be a servant. The greatest among you must be a servant. That's hard. It's not easy. The greatest among you must be a servant. It doesn't sound like it works. It doesn't sound like it should make sense. It, it, it doesn't match in this world. And that's the whole point. It's not supposed to make sense in the world. It only makes sense in the kingdom because that's how the kingdom operates. It's full of servants. So here's the second thing. Not only do we say to the Lord that when I serve you, I grow, but the second thing is to develop a heart to serve Jesus. You, gotta, you actually have to develop a heart to serve Jesus. It takes a heart to serve the Lord because here's what's going to happen when you start serving the Lord and the challenges come your way. It's going to be so difficult to take correction. It's going to be difficult, hard. Pride will show up. All kinds of reasons to say, I'm out. But don't. I always say this, never step out of ministry, step up to Christ. If you're ever going to step so-called out of ministry, it's for the purpose of something greater for ministry. Stepping out of ministry is like cutting off your arm and saying, I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I'll sew it later. I'll sew it back on later. I'll take care of it later. No, the moment it's severed, you're dying. We say this even in a separation, in a marriage, that separation, we coach separation only for the purpose of getting back together with your spouse under certain circumstances. I understand abuse and things like that. That is a totally different kind of counsel. But when two people are having a difficult time, and we listen and we say, okay, here's what the Bible says. Then that time from each other is for the purpose of reconciliation. And so it is in ministry. The purpose of us getting healthy is not necessarily to say, oh, you're going to go back into that position. It's to say, God wants to restore this first. And then when this is restored, when the heart is good, and when there's healing then whatever he calls you to do in serving him, he's going to make that decision. He's going to find what best fits you. It's not what, it's not what, what, is what I want. It's, Lord, what do you want? What do you want for me to do for you? That's what a servant is. And you've got to develop a heart to serve Jesus Christ. Otherwise, if it's all head knowledge, then it, it makes sense here intellectually. And you can put all the reasons why and it'll make sense. You got the best argument. But if there's no heart there, Jesus says, That's not, I'm not looking for this. I'm looking for the heart behind the servant. And the longer I take to serve, the more it hardens until God softens it once again. The Bible says in Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. You know, as you develop your heart for Jesus Christ to serve him and others, he doesn't forget that. Did you know that if you serve, if it's this church or whatever else church, when you serve, God notices. He notices when you serve. You may just pick up a piece of paper and maybe you do maintenance and you help with that. And you may feel like, wow, it's constant, constant, constant rubbish all over the place. I'm constantly doing this. And after a while, the heart can erode, and now it's all about picking up rubbish. But God still sees you. You may feel like in the parking lot, oh, it's raining, and I'm parking cars. It's raining. Oh, it's so frustrating. My shoes are soaking wet. God still sees that. He sees the hard work put into it. You may be with our children, and they're like running amok on you, jumping all over you, not listening. It doesn't really happen like that. I'm just throwing the worst-case scenario. And you're wondering, oh my goodness, why did I sign up for this? God still sees that. 
He sees all the hard work you and I put into serving him. We don't serve new hope. We serve Jesus. It's plain and simple. We serve Jesus through the church, but we don't serve the church. Do you catch what I'm saying? You don't serve the pastor. You don't serve people in that kind of capacity. People benefit from you serving, but we serve Jesus. That's the first thing. We serve him. And yeah, we do serve people in that way, but not out of order. It's to serve Christ. And once we forget that, now it becomes about, oh, if it's comfortable for me or not. And Jesus says, no, I I see everything you do. And you know what Jesus does so well is when he sees the hard work put into his ministry in advancing his kingdom, he comes alongside of you and I and he helps us to grow in him because he sees that, okay, you're doing, you're, you're, you're making a difference for my kingdom. When you used to sit in the seats, you're not making a difference. So I I want to bless you even more, but you're limiting my capacity to bless you, to teach you, and to grow you up. Because in this arena, there are going to be far more challenges as a player versus a spectator. Far more challenges. Oh, there are challenges being a spectator. The challenge is when you see the referee blow a call, you're like, oh, that instant replay. My team should have won. And I feel like that sometimes when the Detroit Lions lost, but that's not the case. When you'd watch it from the grandstands, you have all the reason to complain. You can say whatever you want in the grandstand and feel good about it. Those in the seats can complain all they want. And they can point faults. They can actually look at the team and say, oh, that guy didn't block. You, you, you're junk. I don't even know why you're on the team. Get this guy out. Fire that coach. Get, this, get that quarterback off my team. Put him on somebody else's team. We can say those things, and we do. But when we're on the field, here's the major difference. Those in the grandstands and in the seats, they're, they're going to still kind of deal with the same thing. But these guys see the problem. These guys solve them. The line of problems are long. The line for problem solvers are short. Very short. Jesus said it himself. He said, the the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are so few. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that there may be enough workers for his field. Serving has nothing to do with you and I. It has nothing to do with how gifted I am or how well we can do things. It has to do with his field and his harvest because people are dying. And honestly, if they don't know Jesus, they're not going to be with him in heaven. I, as a believer, with Christ living in me, cannot see that happen. If Christ lives in you, something should tell you you don't belong in the seats. Something should tell you that no matter what it takes, you're going to get on the playing field. If Christ lives in you, something is going to tell you to wake up. Something is is going to encourage you. Something is going to speak to you. Something is going to embrace you and love you and heal you because you don't belong in the seats. You are God's star player. His number one draft choice. And all we look at is our flaws. We look at our mistakes. We look at what we're not capable of doing. And God says, you you forgot one thing. It's not going to be you. It's going to be me. My perfect love in you. For it is I who no longer live, but Christ in me. He's the Lord of the harvest. The question is, is he the Lord of the laborers for the harvest? I pray that tonight, yeah, I told you it was going to be challenging, but I pray that tonight maybe God would 
to spark some spiritual awakening in all of us. And even if we do serve, that God would call us to a, just another level of growth in serving him from milk to meat. Just, Lord, I want to do greater things for you. And maybe after tonight, your life is going to take on a whole new role, a whole other level of growth. Because everything we do is discipleship. And it's the year of harvest for us. Many are yet to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Have yet to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. God's not waiting for us as New Hope Hila Hawaii. God's waiting for you as a believer in Christ. Some of you, you're serving Christ and you, you give all you got. And sometimes it's hard. You make sacrifices. You go through ups and downs like everyone else. But you understand the rewards. You, you say to yourself, when you have to get up, when you have to make a sacrifice, when you have to sleep early, when you have to bring a change of clothes, when you have to cut this out or, or sacrifice this, you say, for the greater cause, this is easy to do. For the greater cause, this is why I said yes to you, Christ. For the greater cause, this is why I'm putting this on the side and I'm saying yes to you. For the greater cause, that it's not about us anymore. It's about who Jesus is and what he wants to do. Turn on the news. That should encourage you enough that time is short. And there is a lot of work to be done in the kingdom of God. But we're not alone. I'm so glad for that. I am glad that Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. He's looking for laborers for his field. Some of you are thinking, okay, so what's my next step? Well, how, do I, how, how, do I, how do I move in this direction? What, what do I do from this point on? Because I, I, I see that God is, is doing something in my heart. Well, here's the last thing. Jesus calls you, you and I, to his field. It's his field. He owns it. Wait a minute. So if Jesus owns the field and we belong to him, we're part owners, aren't we? Imagine if you're part owner of your favorite football team's field. Doesn't that feel good? It's that like you could just go anytime. You could go wherever you wanted to go. You can meet all the players. That's just how it is in the kingdom of God. Our owner owns it all. So he gives you access to those who are yet to be harvested. And we use the word harvest as a way to say there are many people who have yet to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 1 Peter 4.10, it says that God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah says, Then I heard, a, I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said this. Here I am. Send me. It was just simple. There's a need, Lord, and you need, you need something? Here I am. Send me into your field. And when the coach calls you onto the field, that's not the right time to suit up. That's not the time when, when coach says, okay, Loxina, in. Oh, wait, i got to get my gear. <laughs> I can't say that at that point. I can't say to my coach, let me go get my mouthpiece, my helmet, my pads. i got to get my gear. He's going to be like, you know what, i got to find someone else. So listen very carefully. You may think you're not well-equipped. You may think that, well, I don't, I don't got my gear. Everything you and I have been through, everything up until this point has suited you up to serve the Lord. Everything that you and I have been through has suited you up to serve the Lord. Think about it. everything that you have been through, every, every mistake, every pain, every sin, every suffering, every triumph, everything that you have been through brought you to this point because there are going to be people who need your kind of encouragement. As the Bible tells us, God uses the same grace through you that he has given to you for someone else who has gone through the same thing that you have gone through. It's by no mistake that we are in the kingdom of God with all of these life lessons. It doesn't go to waste. He's calling you to his field. Let me close with this scripture. I'm going to ask Glenn if he could come up to the keyboard. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, it says, The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent 
them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. Catch that. He sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. And these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. He sends you and I to various places before he even gets there. So you're going to sense that. And when you do, follow his lead. And you'll see him do great things through you and I. And one day when we get to heaven, only then will we be able to see the touchdowns you and I have scored. Not because of us, but because of what Christ has done. It's always about him and how good he is. And so as we close in prayer tonight, my prayer is that whatever God has spoken to you, that you would just trust in what he is saying and follow his lead. Would you pray with me? Bow your heads for a moment. Lord, first of all, we, we do thank you that you are the Lord of the harvest. That there is no mistake in that, it's by no mistake that you have saved us for a purpose, for a reason. You've given all of us different talents and, and gifts and personalities. But one person alone is not supposed to be just trying to do it all. One person can make a difference. But many people put together make an unstoppable team for your kingdom. And so we need one another. We pray for more workers for your field because the harvest is so great. We pray that you would stir in our hearts how we get to be a part of your, your bigger picture of what your kingdom is like. That we would, if we're a fan, if we're, if we're not serving, if we're not using our gifts for you, that something would, would, would spark our motivation and it wouldn't be out of anything else but your spirit because that should be enough, Lord. Your call on our life should be enough for us to move in that direction. It's not a spirit of condemnation but a spirit of calling. It's not a spirit of guilt but a spirit to go. To go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them all that you have taught us. You're going to be with us even to the end. So, Lord, I pray that for all of us, that we become more like you and be the servant of all. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. 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 Amen.